Let's dive into our first module on markets everywhere. Now, when you first heard the title of this short course, Incentives in Computer Science, you may have thought it was a weird combo. Like, what do incentives have to do with computer science? And so in this first module, we're going to take a look at technology around us, and we're going to see that there's lots of markets, huge markets out there in the world that really exist only because of the huge advances that have occurred uh, in computer science over the last couple of decades. For those of you that are computer science majors, some of you may well wind up working for the companies that run these markets. This module is going to be pretty wide ranging, so let me just highlight what some of the overarching themes are going to be that you can keep an eye out for. Um, so first of all, markets are everywhere. And after seeing lots and lots of examples of them, as we're about to do now, uh, you might start looking at the world a little bit differently. You might start seeing markets where you didn't realize there were any before. And indeed, you know, for me, if, if the number one thing outcome I would love for you to have from this short course is just the tools to, when you want to, be able to look at the world a little bit differently, through a little bit different of a lens, uh, and have an economic or game theoretic interpretation of how the world works. This is going to be a good example of that. The second reason to go through lots and lots of examples of different types of markets is you can start recognizing the similarities and differences between them. Uh, so there are sort of different categories of markets, uh, and it's worth knowing a rough taxonomy of what they look like. Uh, that way, if you're grappling with issues with some market that you care about, you can look at other markets in the same category, perhaps for inspiration about how other people might have solved the same problems that you're facing. But then you also sort of appreciate how small tweaks in the details of a, of, a, of a setup can make a big difference about what design you'd want to use. So the idiosyncratic details of an application can matter a lot when you're trying to figure out what type of market to build. Finally, lots of things can go wrong with a market. We'll just talk about maybe one or two of those things. But lots of different things can go wrong. But there are tools for mitigating the issues. And if you want to learn more about that, the key word you should look up is market design. And indeed, you can find entire courses developed, uh, devoted to market design, uh, often in business schools or economics departments, sometimes also in engineering. Now let's start brainstorming about different markets out there, which uh, really only exist because of the advances in computer science uh, in the 21st century. Maybe the most obvious example of uh, something that's obviously a market and obviously is kind of very tech would be Amazon, right? Amazon would not exist without the internet. Amazon would not exist without the World Wide Web. Uh, and Amazon would have nowhere near the same reach without modern wireless communication and smartphone technology. So definitely a market that's been enabled by technological advances. Now, why has Amazon been so successful? What did they bring to the table? Because, you know, after all, before Amazon existed, it's not like it was hard to say, buy a book. Back then, in the mid-90s, there were bookstores all over the place, and you could just go to your local bookstore and buy it or ask them to order it for you. Same thing for clothes, foods, whatever. So Amazon's main contribution wasn't really uh, to create a new market, but rather to take an existing market and make it better. So better in what sense? Well, you know, primarily just more convenient, right? So you didn't have to leave your house to order from Amazon. You just order it from home. Uh, they were open 24-7. Uh, they carried all kinds of different products, so you didn't have to go to different stores for different types of products, uh, et cetera. Uh, another thing is you'd hope there would be cheaper prices because of economies of scale. Um, on the other hand, you know, there certainly were positives to Amazon, but there are also negatives, right? So whoever you're buying from on Amazon, you probably don't have much of a relationship with. Uh, and you may not even trust that seller very much. Whereas your local brick and mortar store, uh, you might well have a relationship with the people who run that store and a, and a much higher degree of trust over transactions with that store. So Amazon arguably took an existing market and made it better in some ways, but perhaps also made it less safe in another sense. Now, that lack of safety can be largely mitigated through reputation systems like you see on Amazon. And actually, we'll touch on reputation systems again in both the second and third modules uh, of this short course. So Amazon is one obvious example. So how about other examples in technology uh, of successful companies that basically took an existing market and just made it better as opposed to creating an entirely new market? Well, uh, the next example, maybe this will strike you as slightly less obvious, but it's still a very good example, uh, which are Google and Facebook. 
Now, probably you think of Google and Facebook as a search engine and a social network, respectively. Uh, but if you look at how the bills actually get paid, both of those companies are really massive advertising firms. That's pretty much the source of almost all of their revenue is from advertising. Let me give you an analogy. So back when I was a kid, I watched a lot of television. And, uh, you know, back then when I was young, before I studied economics and all these other topics, uh, my assumption was that the, the reason of existence for a television channel, it was there to bring me cool programming. Only much later did I realize that what was really going on is that the point of the television channel was to get my attention so that that attention could be redirected to sponsored content. Very similar to the business model driving Google and Facebook. Now, advertising, of course, has been a huge market forever, right? So probably many of you have seen the series Mad Men, for example. Um, but Google and Facebook en enabled advertising at a far finer, finer level of granularity than had ever been possible. So they took a massive existing market and really added new functionality to it. They made it better. For another example that uh, should be familiar, let's think about ride sharing companies. So like Uber and Lyft. To the extent that there was a market for rides before Uber and Lyft, it was relatively small. So you basically had taxis uh, in various cities, plus just kind of ad hoc arrangements. People, you know, posting index cards on bulletin boards and that sort of thing. So Uber and Lyft really, they created a new market or maybe not a totally new market, but they grew an existing mar market by a massive amount, by a couple orders of magnitude. So Uber, they started with limousines, which made sense because limo drivers could traditionally only be booked by appointment. And as a result, those drivers often had long idle periods between rides. So many of those drivers were happy to earn some extra money during those idle times uh, through Uber. Of course, you know, now, you know, in 2020, it's very clear that the size of the ride sharing market was far bigger than anyone initially realized. Uh, and of course, we know that there are lots of amateur drivers that seem happy to lend their time uh, and car part of the time to pick up some extra cash. Convenience, of course, was also uh, part of the appeal of Uber and Lyft. And indeed, many of the sort of uh, markets enabled by technology that have really taken off in the 21st century, you get this combination. Uh, they both made an existing market much bigger than it used to be, uh, and they also improved it in various ways. And it's not hard to rattle off a few more examples. Let me just mention a few more ones that are probably coming to your mind as well. Uh, Airbnb, for example, opening up the market for spare rooms. Airbnb, of course, was not the first technology company to improve the market for spare rooms. So, for example, uh, Craigslist was well before Air Airbnb and lots of the rentals across the United States, in both in the late 90s and in the aughts, uh, went through Craigslist. And now Airbnb has come along and made that market still better and still safer. I do also want to mention, if only for historical interest, eBay. Now, in this day and age, in 2020, you might think of eBay as just kind of a smaller and you know, more poorly organized version of Amazon. Um, but back when it came out in the mid 90s, uh, it was different. It really, you know, if you browsed on eBay back then, it felt like the union of all of the world's garage sales happening at the same time. Uh, so eBay at the beginning really sort of opened up a new market for secondhand bric-a-brac. StubHub would be another example, uh, expanding the market for secondhand tickets for, say, concerts and sporting events. Uh, and in many cases, actually, StubHub made the market for secondhand tickets safer than it had been previously, when it may have mostly been cornered uh, by various dodgy ticket scalpers. A number of different companies have brought uh, parts of the labor market online, especially the parts uh, to do with temp jobs and freelancing. Lots of examples, you know, Upwork, Fiverr, etc. And as with, you know, Uber and Lyft, this market always existed. There's always been freelancers, um, but this technology enabled that market to grow to a heretofore uh, impossible size. Last but not least, we have dating platforms and dating apps, you know, Tinder and things like that. Uh, obviously, you know, there's always implicitly been a market out there for dates, but it's never been as explicitly articulated uh, as it is now. 
Now that we have in mind a healthy set of examples of markets that have only really arisen for the most part in the 21st century uh, and really depend on the technical advances that we've seen during that time, with these examples in mind, now let's discuss a little bit compare and contrast. And in particular, let's focus on the axis of which of these markets are more on the centralized side and which are more decentralized.